I, I've labeled this the clash of the kingdoms tonight. But it started right before the new, it started right before the new year. I was, I was in my shop. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I own a company called Flying Donkey Creative. Uh, we make signage and do vehicle wraps. And most of the time, it kind of looks like a tornado has gone off in my building. And occasionally, something finishes and ships out. <laughs> and on this Saturday that I was working, my shop was a complete disaster. All of my projects were in phases, but nothing was coming along. And I was just having one of those moments where it's like, I can't see the picture. I can't see what's happening, Lord. And he said, it's like this. I'm moving, and you're uncomfortable. But step back a second. Look at this sign right here. And this sign was super complicated. I mean, it had so many steps, I couldn't even count the steps. But he asked me to step back, and I stepped back. And I was like, oh, it's almost done. I didn't think it looked like that. And the Lord said, that's the problem when you look with your sight. You don't think something's done. We don't recognize that God is up to something. And then he spoke a phrase to me. He said, 2023 is the year that you are free to be the me that I've created you to be. Amen. Now, I, I don't know where you come from. I don't know what your experiences are. But I can tell you for me, the Lord telling me that I'm free to be me, come on, uh, that is like, oh, my goodness, you don't know. <laughs> Seldom growing up was I ever allowed to be me. I'm very loud. I'm very rambunctious. I always get in trouble for being loud. I have too much energy at times. Um, I wanted to play football, but I was really small. So the answer was no. You can run cross country like your dad. I wanted to play the drums. Oh no, that's too loud. You can play trumpet like your dad. I, you know, so all my life, I just did the things that I was told to do. And I started to act like I was supposed to act, but at the same time, not ever feeling like I was ever allowed to be alive. I grew up in the beautiful state of California, but I never felt home in California. We moved every year that I was growing up. I went to a different school every year, always starting over. Man, when you've got identity issues and you gotta start over all the time, well, you know it, there's just nothing but conflict and fights. I and mean, that's what happened. I was uncomfortable. So for the Lord to tell me that this was the year that I could be free to be me, I was excited. And as I sat down to work on this message, I, um, I opened up, my, my wife's been reading the Passion Translation. Any Passion Translation lovers in here? My wife's a big one. Um, but I read it, I opened it up, <laughs> and I started reading in Psalm 139. And this is crazy. This is how Psalm 139, starting verse 16. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. I just had to stop. It's like when God gives you a word and then you go to his word and you hear the word. I, oh my goodness. I was so excited. But listen to this verse though. Before I'd seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Every single moment you were thinking of me. How precious and wonderful to consider that you cherish me constantly in your every thought. Oh God, your desires towards me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. When I wake each morning, you are still with me. That alone will preach, yes? <laughs> I mean, wow. Uh, let's see, clicker, right is forward. Always remember that, right is forward. Um, <laughs> How about you with expectations? Did you grow up like I did? Have you had to feel like you've had to fit into a situation that you didn't belong in? The confusion that it causes internally when we think that we are constrained to be who we are. We don't know what to say. We don't know how to stand. We don't know how to sit. I mean, even going to dinner in my family was very difficult because you had to sit right. You had to use the right fork. You had to use the right spoon. You had to sit at the right angle. You had to pick your napkin up a certain way. You had to put it on your lap a certain way. 
I was a rebellious little snot is what I was. And that was very hard for me. But that's how my life was. Sometimes the world just puts all these expectations on us and we don't feel like we are free to be who God called us to be. But thank goodness for 2023 because it's time to be free. It is really time to be free. But how did we get here? How did we get here? So I have to put my glasses on because I definitely can't always read things easily. Uh, we have an enemy. We actually have an enemy. I think sometimes we forget that Satan is a real enemy. You know, the Old Testament, uh, he's, he's called Lucifer. But the most amazing part, uh, when you start studying who he was, reading about who he was, did you realize that Satan was Jesus' light bearer before he fell? He is the one who went before Jesus with all his timbrels and all the music and all the light. He was the herald of Jesus. He was right there. He knew everything. But some reason he decided that he was better than God and he wanted to ascend. And that was it. He did the opposite of ascend. He descended forever and ever and ever and ever. And since that moment in time, he has been after us. Because what did it say in Psalms 139? That God created us and wrote our book out before we were even made. So way back in whenever the beginning was, Lucifer knew that there was a call on our lives. Lucifer knew that we were going to be one with God. And he could not have that. So he has created into me, or I am, and, uh, say that word. You smart people can say that word. I can't try to do that. Really bad stuff, okay? And we have problems now. That, that's the way that it is. He wants to chaos. He wants to deceive us. He wants to take our identity and have us exchange it for something else. That's what he likes to do. He takes the smallest thing and twists it. Just like Eve in the garden. And guys, we didn't get off the hook. Adam was standing right there and just let it all go downhill. But he twisted the word. And he said, did God really say? Wow. Wow. That little twist right there. Well, he hasn't stopped. He hasn't stopped. But I was looking back over history. Charlene and I talk about this a lot. It gets really loud in the house when I start getting passionate about time frames. <laughs> but when did the church start, take that step, that little twist? 1954. What happened in 1954? We had the Revenue Act. Lyndon B. Johnson was president, and he hated the church. He hated the influence the church was having on society. So he decided to take a little twist. Under the IRS tax code, the church was already tax exempt. But Lyndon B. Johnson said, hey, here's this thing. We're going to come up with this 501c3, and we're going to make you tax exempt. And everybody goes, yay! And then he goes, and then in exchange for me being such an awesome friend of the church, you can't say anything ill of the government. And if you do, you're going to lose your tax exemption. Wow, that is a nasty little twist. But starting in 1954, the churches bought into this lie and decided that they would exchange that to serve the God of Mammon and not pay taxes. What happened since then? 1962, prayer taken out of school. 1969, we have Woodstock. 1972, we have Roe versus Wade. You see how a little twist, a little deviation, and all of a sudden we're running down the wrong track? That's horrible. But what else happened? The church, we had the great healing move in the 60s. We had the great evangelism explosion in the 70s. 
And then you would think the next thing would be discipleship. Yeah, because Jesus said disciple all the nations. But that, that's, that's, that's not what happened. The 80s and the 90s were filled with what? Building big churches. Building the I kingdom. The my kingdom. But what about God's kingdom? And then we rolled into seeker sensitive. Oh, we can't be here too long. Oh, we don't want to talk about Jesus. We don't want to talk about the blood. That's offensive. No, that's life. That's truth. But back in the past, we bought the lie. And the lie goes downhill. Now look at today. 2023. The year to be free. To be me that God has created me to be. It is time for the church to be free. To be the church that we are called to be. Jesus said that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can steal our identity, he can kill our purpose. He can destroy our legacy. He can destroy our call. But he cannot destroy Jesus. But Jesus said, I came that you would have life and have life abundantly. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. So this is why I, I, I entitled this The Clash of the Kingdoms. Because we are in a battle. The kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness. It says here in Colossians 1.13, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Whew. Stuff right there. I know everyone is familiar with the seven mountains. I'm beginning to think it's more like the seven kingdoms. Government, religion, family, education, um, media, business. These are the areas. You know, tonight we sang the song... Mountains be made low. These mountains have to be made low. There's nothing wrong with any of the influences of these mountains. But none of these mountains have the truth. And you can see how the enemy has worked in all of these. What's the number one thing that has been under attack since 1954? Church. Family. Right? Right? You're not, there's so much confusion. You don't even know if you're a man or a woman these days. How crazy is that? I mean, that's so basic. Yet he's gotten away with it because we haven't spoken up. We haven't done our job. I, I picked the song tonight, Let the Lion Roar. Because when we're free, we're free to roar. We're free to praise we're free to run. We're free to dance. We're free to be who we were created to be. And who were we created to be? To be in perfect union with God. That's what we were created for. Praise. Praise and function. So what's the solution to where we find ourselves these days? It's us. It's the bride of Christ. We are kings and priest. That's what it says in Revelations 1.6. What do kings do? It's a king's function. Kings rule. They make law. They make decrees. That's what kings do. What do priests do? Priests worship. Priests make intercession. Priests speak truth. So we have that twofold function. So Revelation 1.6, to him who loves us has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory forever. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him 
all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. So that he himself will have first place in everything. What place? First. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself. It's the Greek word up there for ecclesia. You know the little twist that the enemy does? The ecclesia, well, I grew up uh, in my church years. Um, I've learned that the ecclesia was the called out ones. That's a good, that, that's a good description. But somewhere along the way, the ecclesia got to be church. Well, church became a building, became a place to be, a place to go, not something to be, not the bride of Christ. When you study ecclesia, though, you find out that the ecclesia was a Roman term. It had a Roman connotation. When Rome conquered countries, they deputized people to take the cultures and the laws of the empire and teach the people in the new conquered land how to speak, how to think, and how to act like a Roman. How's that? The famous uh, thing, um, the revelation that Peter has in Matthew, he said that you are the Christ. And Jesus said, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, ecclesia, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I propose to us that our job is to be the ecclesia. That we have territories. We have our kingdom. Our kingdom is the place where our feet tread. You might be a stay-at-home mom. You might own a business. You might work in a corporation. You might work in a hospital. You might be a worship leader. You might be a pastor. You are you. You are unique. But nonetheless, you are the ecclesia. You control your territory. I control my territory. And too often... I've taken the easy road. Been sold a bill of goods about the word peace. Oh, 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 people who love Jesus, they just have to be peace and accepting. You can't ever say anything in opposition. You can't act in opposition. You're just being peace. And then if they want to take it a step further, they're like, oh, you're not supposed to speak up. You're supposed to be meek. No, I am being meek. I didn't take your head off. <laughs> Meek is power under control. Meek is me choosing not to say something that will fillet you. That's meek. God will fight my battles. But for too long, I bought the lie. Oh, you got to be nice. Oh, if you are a good church person, or you're a good godly man, you're going to be quiet, you're going to stand there, you're not going to create waves. And everything is just going to be smooth. That's your job. Be kind. I, my wife is really nice and she's really kind. But boy, if you do something not in truth in our family, you're going to find out there's another side. And we get truth. <laughs> and we get a lot of truth. Back to the mountains. What mountain do you think you're called to? Where do you think you fit? When we moved here from California, it was the strangest thing. I, I got to tell you. I grew up in California my life. My, my, my wife grew up in California. We're Californians. But we never fit. 
she didn't fit any more than I fit. We were definitely fish out of water. We, uh, the second year of our marriage, we, we came to Georgia. My dad had moved to Georgia. We came out for, it was a Christmas vacation we came out and brought John. And at this time, my parents were going to Eastside Baptist Church. Yes, I used to be Baptist. Don't hold it against me. Um, I learned to love the word in the Baptist Church, so that's all good. Um, there was a pastor at Eastside Baptist Church named Clark Hutchinson. I listened to Clark Hutchinson preach that week that, uh, that I visited my parents. And I like, that is a man who knows God. And I like him. And I turned to my wife, I think we were having lunch, and I said, if we ever get the opportunity to move to Georgia, we're moving here and we're going to Eastside Baptist Church. Fast forward a couple years, after that, lo and behold, it was time to make a move. <laughs> and my wife goes, well, what are we going to do? I said, we're packing things up. We're moving to Marietta, Georgia. And so that's how, we, that's, how we got, that's how we got here. But I didn't know anything. And the weird thing was, when I got here, and I, I drove in, because I, I, Charlene and, and our young son, uh, they flew out here to stay with my parents. And I was tasked with getting everything packed up and, and, and then driving, making the big drive. When I got to Georgia, I, I kid you not, when I crossed the state line in the car, I knew I was home. I immediately felt I had lived here my entire life. But I knew God said we were supposed to come to Marietta. What do kings do? Kings decree. We make decrees so how did I find my fit? Because I didn't really know. I was a cook. That's all I had really done for my professional life was cook. And I decided that East Side had this huge job bank. So I, I saw a job to, for sweeping floors. I was like, oh, that's great. I'm going to sweep floors. And uh, the pay was gigantic. I mean, you would not imagine this. I mean, they were willing to pay you $5 an hour to sweep floors. I mean, that's like, that's a good deal, yeah? So... We, uh, I, I called them up on the phone. I said, hey, you know, uh, is this job still available? They said, yeah, but you would need to start today. And that's kind of weird. It's just pushing the broom. I said, well, I can't start today. I've got another job interview. And they said, well, that's too bad. You can't have the job. Okay. Like, all right. I said, wait, 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 wait. You know, I had to pull the Columbo. Hey, just can I ask a question before you get our phone? I said, you've got the word graphics in your name. Could, do you have a graphics manager? They said, yeah. I said, could I talk to them? And so I talked to the graphics manager, and he said, uh, what do you know? I said, well, I, I know a little bit about computers. He goes, why don't you come see me tomorrow? So I went there the next day, and he hired me on the spot. And get this, it was a 50% raise. <laughs> it was $7 an hour to work in the graphics department. Now, my graphics experience was limited to a little Mac, uh, what did they call that old thing, baby? My, my, little, my Mac Classic. It was a, you thought, do lap, you think laptops are nice? I had a Mac Classic. I picked this 20 pound rock up and I had a little five inch by five inch black and white screen. Not amber, not, not orange, but black and white. And I could do layouts on that. So I was pretty good at doing layouts. So he's showing me around, showing me this Windows, uh, Windows Work Groups 3.11. Got to love that, right, Nathan? Remember those days? <laughs> so I didn't know that I had this talent. And all of a sudden, I'm just picking all this stuff up. And then he's, he's showing me the paint booth. And then all of a sudden, I'm starting to spray with a paint gun. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. He goes, man, that's, that's incredible. How did you learn that? I said, I don't know, man. I just, I could just do it. And I started making colors. He goes, like, how did you learn to make colors? I said, I don't know, man. I'm just playing with these things and it's coming out this way. It's like, that's phenomenal. Three months later, he left and he went to go be a river rat. He loved kayaking. I was tasked with taking over the graphics department of a huge trade show company, not knowing a thing about the trade show industry. I'm not, I'm not, I'm really not kidding. This is all true. <laughs> God was talking to me through this. And I began to figure out things that I didn't know about myself. And all of a sudden, I figured out that I'm supposed to be in the business arena. But in the business arena, I'm a creative type. I solve problems. I also, I also learned, though, 
that my primary gift in life is I'm a disruptor. When I show up, everything has got to change. I don't know if things were wrong before I got there or I just bring this disruption with me, but it seems to follow because everywhere I go, there's change. Pastor uh, preached this last weekend and he talked about us being sandpaper. Um, uh, sandpaper friends, I am, uh, I am of the uh, 30 grit. Um, <laughs> My wife, most of the time, is about 2,000 grit. My son has exceeded me. He's at four grit. <laughs> but we need to find our fit. We have to find our fit. We have to find out how God's wired us. Why? Proverbs 11. Um, the blessing that rests on the righteous releases strength and favor to the entire city. But shouts of joy will be heard when the wicked one dies. The blessing of favor resting upon the righteous influences a city to lift it higher. But wicked leaders tear it apart by their words. Isaiah 61. Um, a few years ago, the Lord gave me this, and it's my, it's my absolute, uh, I guess you would say it's my map scripture. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And if, yes, if that sounds familiar to you, it's in Luke 4. That's what Jesus said. In the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting in the Lord for the display of his splendor. But then catch this. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. Say rebuild. rebuild. And restore places long devastated. Say restore. restore. They will renew the ruined cities. Say renew. We will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. And you will be named ministers of our God. And you will feed on the wealth of nations. And in their riches you will boast. Say, I am anointed. You are anointed. I am anointed. But when we're wrapped up in confusion and uncertainty and we don't really see us as God sees us, we don't feel anointed. We don't know that we're anointed. We don't act anointed. We don't think anointed. We don't decree anointed. And that's what this world needs right now in each of the mountains. Go back to the mountains for a second. Each of the mountains, arts and entertainment, there is an anointing for love in the arts and entertainment. In business, you are anointed to touch people. Education, there's an anointing. Family, there is an anointing. There is nothing wrong with making your family your ministry. Right. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. Moms who have the privilege of being able to stay home to raise their children makes a better home life. Amen. It just does. Government, we have plenty of room for anointing in the government, yes? <laughs> Media and religion. I hate religion. I hate religion. Religion will chew you up and spit you out and then put you back on the treadmill and chew you up again and spit you out. I went to Baptist college. I heard the call of God when, when Charlene and I were dating. I was 20, 21. Um, but I had this really big, bad, deep, dark secret that you're not allowed to have. At that young age, I was divorced. And I heard the call of God. And get this. I went and applied at California Baptist College, which is the Southern Baptist College in California. The one thing you can't be, be a Baptist, is be divorced. That is a no-no. Divorced means straight to hell. That's what it means in the Baptist church. That's what it used to mean back in the 90s. Um, 
But I heard the call of God. And I told them my story. And they said that phrase that you hear sometimes. I don't know why we're doing this, but we're going to let you in. They let me in. And I became an absolutely rabid Baptist. I was kind of like Paul. Paul was killing Christians, man. I was, I was killing everything else, man. And the one thing we really learned in Baptist how to do, we really learned how to kill women. We had no room for women in ministry. You might could be a worship leader, maybe. You might could be a Sunday school teacher, but doggone it, you were never going to get up on that pulpit and bring the word of God. You were never going to be called a pastor. And they didn't have any use for apostles and prophets. Evangelists are good because you've got to bring people in to get their money. It's, that's important in the Baptist world. But we didn't have any room for women. I bought that hook, line, and sinker. Here I am in Baptist college trying to go after the heart of God. And we're learning religion. And I didn't know that I was doing that. And it was horrible. And we even got to Georgia. Like I said, we, we did Baptist church. We did church and Clark Hutchinson, he was, he was just an amazing man of God. But, you know, people are people, right? Even in spirit-filled churches, people can be people. And you just start doing things. They just seem normal, saying things, normal. And life is cold. We didn't believe in the Holy Spirit in the Baptist church. You could get saved, right? I mean, you have to have the Holy Spirit to get saved, but then that's it. Then you got to leave him because he's not welcome. <laughs> Y'all laugh. I'm telling you some truth. <laughs> so we, we end up at this other church. Clark left. Clark left uh, East Side. We moved to uh, uh, another Baptist church. Uh, yeah. But the funniest thing happened in this Baptist church. The pastor leaves. They get this, they get this search committee, and they get this wild, crazy guy. Uh, they interview him. You know how Baptists do it? We have to approve the man of God, or we can say no. So you always, the search committee goes out there and brings in their best candidate, and then you sit down and you have lunch. Because once they've already made the decision, then you have lunch or dinner with the church, and you know, you're supposed to give it the rubber stamp of approval because you trust the search committee that they've done their job. Well, this pastor, he was talking about this Holy Ghost thing, this Holy Spirit thing. <laughs> I'm all like, well, this is not going to set well. This is a Baptist church. But what sold me was his wife, Laura. Her name was Laura, wasn't it? She's the greatest woman I ever met. They, uh, they, the women were like wanting to, you know, put on their best and ask Laura this most spiritual question. It's like, what's it like being married to this incredible man of God? And she says, oh, it's nothing special. I'm just like you. I just sleep with the pastor. <laughs> the greatest moment of my Baptist life. I'm all like, I'm all in on this guy. I don't know what he believes, but I like her. <laughs> he then hires an associate out of Louisiana named Terry Black. Terry Black is this on fire, totally filled with the Holy Spirit, talking in tongues. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's the devil's language. <sighs> Okay, you're kind of cool, but oh my gosh, this weird language has got to leave. And everything in me is just wanting to use all my Baptist doctrine to argue everything Terry's teaching. Terry decides he needs to teach the young marrieds class, and we're in the young marrieds class. And I remember the first few weeks, he's just putting up all his stuff, and I'm take, ticking off all my arguments. No, no, got that one proved wrong. Nope, those are C's. Nope, can't happen. And then one day... One Sunday, he's teaching, and all of a sudden, everything he had written on the board, it was like God put down a rose-colored screen on the chalkboard. And when I was looking at the chalkboard, I didn't have any more arguments. There was no more noise. There was no more conflict. And I said, oh my goodness, this has a chance of being the truth the Holy Spirit might actually be alive. Because the one thing I loved about Terry was that he loved and he liked. 
and he embraced you and he encouraged you. And he was really different because that's not the way college professors are and that's not the way pastors are if they don't know Jesus and that's not the way other Christians are if they really don't have the Holy Spirit in their lives and they're just checking boxes wanting to do the right thing hoping like crazy that when it's all done God might accept the treadmill performance and let me in. But you know the whole time when you're on the treadmill you know there's no chance of you getting in. But Terry was different. And so I had to take a really hard look and say, is this for real? And then my friend and I, Ward, we were having a conversation and we said, well, what, what happens if this is real? And we were sitting in church and, you know, in the Baptist church, you got your deacons, right? You know, they all stand out in the parking lot and smoke cigarettes. That's for real. Um, they say no to everything. <laughs> and we're sitting there and we're like, is this Holy Spirit thing real? And, and, and then we just caught a glimpse of the old grouchies, you know? And we said, okay, you know, 40 years from now, do we want to look like that? That was our question. I mean, we're real spiritual, man. Do we want to look like that? And we said, no. In the meantime, my wife had gotten filled with the Spirit. I thought we were going to kill each other. We promised each other that we wouldn't divorce. But I want to promise you the first 10 years of marriage, death was on the table, and it was a real option. <laughs> but then she got filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm really wondering the Holy Spirit's real. And all of a sudden, she's like, nice. I didn't know what to do with nice. <laughs> like, you know, I got my sword out. I'm like ready to duke it out. And she's like, I love you, babe. Oh, that's not the answer I was looking for. Now, what about this? She's like, well, that's fine. If that's what you think we ought to do. Oh, wait, wait a minute. This is wrong. This is wrong. We have to duke it out. But that's not the way it was. And so soon after that, um, we got filled with the Spirit. <laughs> Life changed for us radically in, uh, was that about 93, babe? 93, 94. We, uh, we left that church and we went to a spirit-filled church. And uh, it hasn't been the same since then. But I managed to find religion yet again. And that's why I hate religion so much. Because religion deceives. It's that little twist that we love God, but you've got to go to church and perform. You've got to put your best on all the time. The only best that God asks us for is the best time. Give me your what? Give me your first. Give me your first. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to skip ahead here to my, to my clothes here. So it's all about being in the kingdom. For me, the kingdom, my mountain's business, my heart is the city. My heart is my territory. Two years ago, we absolutely heard the call of God on our life that Woodstock's our territory. We took it serious. God moved us to a new church, and I love abiding church. Not supposed to do any commercials, but I love my church. I love my pastor. I love my people that I hang out with. <laughs> I just do. But all that said about the mountains, about being anointed, about having your talents, and God wants to use them. John 17. I know all of you all know this, but this has been a good week of study for me. Now I'm coming to you. Jesus is talking. This is in red letters. I should have put it in red for you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world. He's praying to his fathers. This is right before death. So they would be filled with my glory. I have given them your word. The world hates them because they don't belong to the world. Just as I don't belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. But to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for those who will ever believe in me through their message. Pause. If anybody ever says, show me in the Bible 
that is so old and so outdated that God's actually talking to you today. There you go. Jesus said, but also for all. Say all. all. It includes me. Say that. All. It includes me. All. For all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me. <sighs> so they may be one as we are one. I am in them, you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can all see the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. This is where I want to wrap it up. This is the truth. We went through, like I said earlier, we went through the healing moment. We went through the hope moment with the explosion of evangelism and everything. But the one thing the church hasn't done, we haven't moved into the love and unity movement. Amen. We get too busy. I know. I was there. I've been there. I'm still there on certain areas of my life where I think it's okay to criticize what somebody else is doing. That is from the pit of hell. We are not allowed to criticize what somebody else is doing. I'm not even allowed to criticize churches who do the seeker-sensitive model, not my servant. But I know for me, that wasn't life. There was nothing there for me. But I don't have the opportunity or the privilege or the right to criticize another servant. We think because we live in America and that we're a representative republic and we can speak our mind. I've got freedom of speech. I can tell you how horrible you are. I can tell you how wrong you are. I can tell you how you've missed God. I can tell you how much God hates you. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Jesus said a house divided will fall. We're all praying for revival. We're all praying for the church to rise up. We're all praying for God just to show up and everybody miraculously be healed. But yet we don't want to give them the model, which is love and unity. I didn't come to the Holy Spirit because I was so awesome. I didn't come because God's voice was so loud. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit because of a man named Terry Black who had the guts to love a crazy kid from California. That's what I saw. I had all my religion. I had all my tick marks. I had all the answers until Terry broke him down. And it breaks my heart to see the church that's been asleep in America. We're asleep because we believe in a lie. We don't know the truth. We don't know unity. I don't like the Democrats any more than you do, but there's one thing I absolutely admire about the Democratic Party. They stick together. That's exactly right. They all going to stay in the line and go straight to hell together. But doggone it, that whole line is going to go straight to hell. There's not one person in the Democrat line that's going to say, brother, you're wrong on that. They just go. And they get their evil agenda done because they're unified, which is a spiritual principle. Be unified and move forward. It's time for the church to be unified. Quit pointing fingers. We've got to be love. Jesus said what? Love them. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me. Unity. Love. Unity and love. Where there is love, there's power. 
We're believing for miracles. We're believing for healings. We're praying for people to be raised from the dead. We're praying for cancer to be immediately leave people. It's not incantations. It's not saying the right words. It's not standing on your right foot. It's not walking around the building seven times. It's harder than that. It's we got to love. You know, I have a business not because I'm smart, not because I'm talented. I have a business because God just said, you know what, this is the only environment in which I can speak to you. You're really hard-headed, so I'm going to put you over here and you're going to play with sandpaper all the time. And sometimes I'm going to sand you with 32 grit. Other times I'm going to polish you off with some thousand. And then when you think you arrive, I'm going to take you back to 32 grit because we've got another layer to go. And you start back over again and you wonder, gosh, is this ever going to be done? But he's been telling me this whole time, you got to love. I got people in my shop who are broken and they don't want to hear the word of God. So I got to give them truth, but I can't say Jesus said. I got to give them truth, but I can't say God loves you. I can't give them, I want to tell them, oh my gosh, if you had Jesus, tomorrow's going to be a whole lot better. I got to show them tomorrow's a whole lot better. I got to love them to Jesus, not teach them to Jesus. But we've got to get one with God. We've got to get one with one another. We are the ecclesia. We are the mouthpiece. And if we get moved by love and we step in our territory, we can declare and decree that that territory is going to be saved for Jesus. We can declare and decree that our kids are coming home. We can declare and decree that our relatives are coming home and that people are being healed. But if we don't love, Paul said, I could, I could give my body to the flames. I could do all these great things. I could feed everybody. I could just do all this stuff. But if I don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong. How noisy is it out there in the world right now? It's so noisy, even for me, who likes to be loud and brash. I got to turn the volume down some days. But we got to love. And we've got to learn how to love. And we've got to love hard. And we've got to go after Jesus. And the only way we can love is if we put Jesus first. And when we do that, we're going to see our cities transformed. We're going to see our families transformed. We're going to have an outflow for the love that's in us. That's what the gift is. That's what the calling is. That's what the anointing is. It's the love of God coming into us and all of a sudden transforming our environment beyond anything that we could ever think, see, or imagine. Because God's love is that power. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We love you, Father. Father, I'm, I'm sorry for where I've missed it. The things I think I've said in love haven't been loved, Father. The things I've done haven't been in love. But Father, I thank you for your mercy that we receive your mercy, Father. Father, every man and woman that's in this room, Father, loves you. They faithfully show up, Father, every Thursday night. Father, they show up because they love you. They show up because in their hearts, Father, we know that we're supposed to be doing something different. We're supposed to be doing something more. But we're frustrated, Father, that we're not getting done what we need to get done. And we just give you that frustration tonight, Father. We give it to you. Father, we give frustration so that we can be emptied of ourselves. So that you can fill us afresh. That your love can pour over us, in us, and through us, Father. And not by our works will man be saved. But by your love. By your love, Father. That they will be saved. Father, I declare that America will be saved. I declare a great revival is about to be birthed. Father, we need your love. We need your love. We need your love. Without your love, Father, it's just not going to be fruitful and lasting. So tonight, Father, we choose love.